Please take your Bibles, turning with me to Hebrews chapter 13, and I'm reading verses 20 to 25. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes, I will see you. Greet all of your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. We come to a message I am entitling, Exhorted, Equipped, Advancing. And this is the conclusion of our nearly year-long pursuit through the pages of this book of 13 chapters, the New Testament book of Hebrews. Go with me back to the very beginning and let's canvas where we have been through these weeks and months. We have been considering how that Jesus is the supreme one. He is far better in every way, regardless of who you compare him to and the ministry that he conducted and that he carried out. Jesus is far far better than them all. Chapter 1 of Hebrews introduces us to Jesus and it tells us that Jesus is better than the angels. How many times have you been to the supermarket and the checkout stand has the tabloids and invariably there are some there's something there about angels. Angels being sighted, our world gravitates and are, is mesmerized by angels. But why? Why, oh why, do they pass by Jesus and yet they are absolutely entranced with angels of various kinds? Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the one, verse 8, he is the one who is the Son of of God. Read with me verse 8. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter, the righteous scepter, is the scepter of his kingdom. That is what the Father says of the Son. Jesus, better than the angels. Chapter 2. Jesus is the one who is crowned with honor, we read in verse 9. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. He is the one who has been made like his brethren, as we read at the end of chapter 2. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren, in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in all that he, which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. That's you, and that's me, made like his brethren. Chapter 3 tells us that Jesus was better than Moses. Here the writer is addressing those who were born as Jews, who were raised in Judaism, and he holds out a fascinating statement that you revered Moses, you read about him constantly in the synagogue, and you read from the pages which he penned. But Jesus, he is the one who is better than Moses. Chapter 3 and verse 3, 
Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. And verse 15 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Here we come before Jesus, not with hard hearts, but ready to hear what he has to say to us, for he is better than the mighty prophet Moses. Chapter 4 tells us that Jesus was better than Joshua. Joshua, of course, was the one who did what Moses was forbidden to do. Moses had been forbidden to go into the land of promise. God had told him, you will die before the people step in there. And so it was. But Joshua, the one who followed after Moses, he was the one who led the people into the land of promise. But even here, we are told as it speaks of rest, verse 8 of chapter 4, if Joshua had given them rest, the real rest that they were looking for, that their hearts craved, God would not have spoken of another day after that. And then again, verses 14 to 16, as chapter 4 concludes, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet a very definite difference, yet without sin. Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Chapter 5, Jesus is the one who was appointed our high priest. Verses 4 and 5 say, And no one takes the honor of being a priest to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. He is the one who appointed Jesus, our faithful and great high priest. Chapter 6. Better things on ahead. And that verse 9 says, Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way, in a very stern and forthright and direct way. Better things concerning you. These people, they were in danger of drawing away. They were in danger of leaving the most precious treasure that anyone could ever find, salvation in Jesus' name, the free gift of heaven and everlasting life. They thought that the sufferings that they were enduring for the name of Christ were perhaps just too much. Perhaps they were feeling they, came, they had come to the tipping ground and that they needed to pull back, they needed to pull away, and what a mistake that would have been. And so the writer says, we're convinced that you're not going to go down that road, that you're going to be wiser than to pull away. Chapter 7, Jesus is held out as a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, and Jesus is held out as one better, far better than Aaron. Jesus was not of the priestly line of Aaron, for that was a line which kept changing constantly through the years and through the generations. But Jesus, he was not a priest simply for a period of time. He was a priest forever, one who is there to intercede on our behalf. 
Chapter 8 speaks of a better tabernacle and a better covenant that Jesus works in. The priests of this world, they entered into a copy of the tabernacle in the wilderness and a copy of the temple that was subsequently built in Jerusalem. But Jesus, he did not enter into a copy or a shadow. He entered into heaven itself, there to appear before the throne of God, there to present his very own blood as the atonement for your sin and for mine. Jesus, in working in a better tabernacle and under a better covenant. Chapter 9, and we go to verses 27 and 28, the conclusion of chapter 9. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, once, and after this comes judgment, So Christ, here there is a parallel, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly wait for him. To those who eagerly await him. These people, they were no longer eagerly awaiting Christ's coming once again. They had been distracted, they had been disheartened, they had been discouraged, and the writer is saying, oh, lift up your eyes and see what is on ahead. Just as each of us die once, Christ has made not 500,000 sacrifices, or a million sacrifices, he has made one sacrifice for you. And that is so powerful that cleansing comes to you and it is eternal cleansing. It doesn't, it's not a sacrifice, it's not an offering that needs to be repeated again. Chapter 10, and I begin in the middle of the chapter, It says in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, I want to give you nine answers that are given here. You see, doctrine is vitally important for us. The teaching, that is the bedrock upon which we build our faith. But there is a natural outflow that comes from that foundation, from the doctrine and from the teaching of the scriptures. Some people would say, well, who cares if Jesus died on Calvary's cross? Who cares if he's a high priest? Who cares if he is a priest who lives forever? There is a natural outflowing of how we now are to live as a result of what Christ has done for us and the surrender which we naturally are to render to him as our Lord and as our Master, as our Redeemer, the one who has purchased us with his very blood. Let us, first of all, draw near, verse 22. Secondly, let us hold fast, verse 23. Thirdly, let us consider how that we might stimulate one another to good deeds. Fourthly, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, verse 25. Verse 32 says that we are to remember the former days. These people, they had originally, when they came to Christ and surrendered their lives to him, they, first of all, were made a public spectacle and they didn't think anything of it because of the joy of walking with Christ and of knowing sins forgiven. We are told, let us remember. Verse 35 Do not throw away your confidence. We are to retain, let us retain 
that which has great reward. Number eight, verse 36 says, you have need of endurance. And so we say, let us endure. And the final verse 39 says, we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the persevering of the soul, preserving of the soul. So here we persevere and we preserve the soul by our confident trust in Jesus Christ. Chapter 11 then, we are ushered into the hall of faith and so many men and women who walked by faith, by faith, by faith. We are told in verses 1 and 6, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. The writer to the Hebrews is saying, here is your example of how that these men and women, they didn't know what was going to come tomorrow. We know their story. We know how it would end. But for them, each day was a question mark. And they were commended by God as people who walked by faith, who trusted in God, who when the going got difficult, they, cr they clasped God's hand ever tighter and said, Lord, clasp my hand as well ever tighter. And they trusted in Christ even when it did not make sense. And they were commended for having that conviction of things that were unseen to them, even though to us we say, well, of course, it turned out just fine. Well, let's translate that confidence and that faith into our lives. We don't know what is going to happen tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. We don't know what the future holds, but if we learn anything from these people, it is in good days and bad, when it seems that the promise is right there or when it seems so very far away that we continue to hold fast and trust resolutely in the Lord. Out of chapter 11, that hall of faith that we are ushered along and we see all of these great lives to the right and to the left, we are then taken into chapter 12 and we are told that we are to fix our eyes upon Jesus, always setting our gaze upon him and that we are to leave it there as we resolutely run the race that is set before us. We see Jesus and we consider how that he has done so much for us he died upon Calvary's cross and the shame and the mocking. He considered it a little thing because he was winning salvation for you and for me. Jesus Christ, we are to consider him and to set our fixed gaze upon him always, always. It's the altar call of the book of Hebrews, just like Romans chapter 12 is the altar call of the book of Romans. We're leading up to this point, and it's the natural conclusion that we draw from what we have written, or what we have read to this, to this point. Then we come into chapter 13, the concluding chapter, where we find ourselves now. And we are addressing brethren. How do we deal with one another? Prisoners. We talk about marriage and money and doctrine. They, we've dealt with suffering and destiny and praise and good works and leadership. And now the writer comes and he's about to conclude. And just as every Sunday of this series that has gone many, many weeks, I've concluded each service with this benediction from Hebrews chapter 13, Verses 20 and 21, now the God of peace. 
I would want you to see that this is not just a few words that are thrown together, poetical words, beautiful words, words that work well at the conclusion of a church service, but it's really the, the encapsulating, it's the, it's the wrapping of this whole letter together. We are to look to Jesus. We are to see what great things God has done for us. And so in light of all that we have read, now in these two brief verses, so much is brought forth to us once again. And we are shown all that we have already seen in sort of extended form. Now the God of peace. These people, they did not have peace in their hearts. They were, they were in turmoil and they were wondering, should we draw back? Maybe we've taken a wrong turn. Maybe we've gone down the wrong road. The writer is wanting to introduce them once again to the God who can bring peace to troubled hearts. Now the God of peace, the one who is able to calm the troubled soul, the one who is able to heal the sin-sick soul, the God of peace, the one who did what had never happened before, the one who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, that one who our eyes are fixed upon and ever to be fixed upon, brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, not a covenant that was made for a few years of earthly history, but in a covenant that will go through all of eternity and that will stand, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will. That is the desire of God, is that we do his will. He has bought us. He has made us his servants. And what an honor that is. Equip you in everything good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so here we come by faith and we desire most earnestly that we be pleasing to him, pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, Everything that we have is through our master and through our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have anything if you don't have Jesus. You don't have anything if you don't realize that it is through him, through his person and through his work that we are made unbelievably rich in heavenly terms. Through Jesus Christ, and to him be the glory forever and ever. At the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow. All praise through all eternity will be heaped upon him for the great things he has done. And the word is amen. Now, I've entitled this message, Exhorted, Equipped, Advancing. Right after this benediction in verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 13, the writer says, I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Some would say, well, it's not as brief as Jude or as brief as second or third John. That's not the point. There was so much more that could have been said of the glories of Christ and of how magnificent he truly is, but a brief word, a word of exhortation. So they had been exhorted, and we also, as we have made our way, our hearts have been stirred, and we have received this word. We have been challenged to press in, to draw near, and to let the doctrine impact our hearts and lives in every way. We've been exhorted. We have been equipped, even as the benediction says, 
that God would equip us in every good thing to do his will, having heard the word of God, having received this instruction, it's like we've got a tool belt that has been filled and a toolbox that is ready for the job that is before us of living to honor and to praise our Savior who has loved us and given his life for us. We have been exhorted, whereas we were laid low because of our eyes getting off onto other things. We've been built up and we've been exhorted to see all that we have in Christ. We've been equipped to go forth and to do his work and to be pleasing in his sight. Now, as the writer signs off, he sends us forth to advance, to advance. And that is what we must do, ever moving forward, but never advancing beyond Jesus Christ, for that is impossible, leaving our eyes upon him. We come back to this benediction, now the God of peace, that is the one who our hearts are set upon and who we worship and we adore. The one who has brought peace to our sin sick, our sin sick and troubled souls, our sin burdened souls. The one who brought up from the dead, the great shepherd. There has never been a greater shepherd than Jesus, never a greater high priest than our Jesus Christ. The blood of the eternal covenant that flowed from Jesus' veins equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Oh, dear friend, move forward, advancing to the praise of his name, and let it all be to the glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege of coming to your word, and we ask that you would stir within us. May we receive this word of exhortation, and Lord, may we receive all the tools and the equipment that you have for us, and Lord, may we now advance to praise and to honor, to glorify you at all times. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.